X-Play, the center of the gaming universe. Today on X-Play, we go hands-on with Ninja Gaiden 2 and talk with the legendary Itagaki. Our forecast calls for bloody showers and plenty of flying limbs. In today's cheat, Kristen Holt helps you with the Herculean task of beating Call of Duty 4 on Veteran. Plus, we go on location to check out the new Command & Conquer first-person shooter, Tiberium. Get ready, it's game time! Hello and welcome to X-Play, TV's most watched video game show. I'm Adam Sessler. And I'm Morgan Webb. We're coming to you from the G4 Studios in Los Angeles on Monday, January 28th. On today's show, we cut through the hype and sit down with Itagaki to get the real story on what to expect in Ninja Gaiden 2. Plus, after years of critiquing games, we finally get to see if Gabe and Taika will put up or shut up in our preview of the Penny Arcade game. Then the Command & Conquer saga gets up close and personal in Tiberium and we'll go on location for a look at this new first person shooter and after today's cheat you'll finally be able to beat Call of Duty 4's mind crushing veteran difficulty. Believe it or not, there is a way. But first, let's go to Adam for all of the latest headlines in our gaming update. Thanks, Morgan. Well, in response to the madness surrounding Fox News' Mass Effect segment, psychology specialist Cooper Lawrence was quoted in the New York Times saying that she had only been told by a friend that Mass Effect was, quote, like pornography, and that she regrets what she said about the game. After seeing actual gameplay in the so-called sex scenes, she admitted that the whole thing was, well, kind of a joke. In spite of regrets, Fox News and Cooper Lawrence have yet to actually say, I apologize. It's about time, guys. Rumors regarding a Metal Gear Solid 4 demo appear to have been shot down. In a webcast from Konami's website, Ryan Payton and associate producer at Kojima Productions confirmed there will be no demo on the PlayStation Network this February. Whether or not a demo will be unleashed before the game's official retail release remains to be seen. New screenshots for Resistance 2 have finally popped up. These images reveal an amazing amount of detail in the game's character and level design. From a shadowy airport hangar to a dark and moody industrial level, the game appears to have huge depth of field and is sporting a lighting engine that even Sam Fisher would be jealous of. Now, details are scarce, but the game is said to feature improved enemy AI, a new health system, and improved checkpoints. Of course, we're also looking forward to the game's 60-player squad-based multiplayer action. I am personally very excited. The release of Super Smash Bros. Brawl is still about one month away. In the meantime, Nintendo has revealed a new masterpiece section in the game where gamers will find free playable demos of classic Nintendo titles. Nine different demos have already been confirmed and include classics like Ice Climber, The Legend of Zelda, Super Metroid, and Star Fox 64. The demos will have time limits, but full versions of these masterpieces can be purchased through the Wii Shop channel. Funny that. That's all for today's gaming update. Be sure to visit, visit us on the web at g4tv.com slash xplay to continue getting all of today's up-to-the-minute video game news. But now, let's go over to Morgan, who has the latest from the creators of the Ninja Gaiden franchise. Thanks, Adam. After two remakes of Ninja Gaiden, Itagaki and Team Ninja have finally moved on to the game's sequel. It promises more weapons, more decapitations, and of course, geysers of blood. Recently, we went hands-on with the further adventures of Ryu Hayabusa. There's probably no one more iconic in the game's industry than the gentleman seated next to me, Tomonobu Itagaki, the creator of Ninja Gaiden, and now Ninja Gaiden 2. I've always felt that the original Ninja Gaiden in 2004 on the Xbox was pretty much the perfection of the action game. Having said that, what are you bringing to the table to once again re-perfect what's already was so good? That's a great question. I'm flattered that you say that Ninja Gaiden in 2004 was the pinnacle of the action game genre. So, you know, we just want to make, make it a little bit more accessible. We want something that is easier to approach, easier to pick up and play. Something that is not necessarily easy to win, but that you're having fun even if you lose. So does this mean that the control scheme will be different than the original Ninja Gaiden, which you definitely had to be more adept at memorizing certain button combinations? 
I think it's safe, it's safe to say that that would be the case. I have uh, added a whole lot of new moves to uh, Ryu Hayabusa's repertoire, and you could literally just be, you know, doing all uh, sorts of button combinations, and you're going to see new animations and new cool uh, attacks uh, in all these different situations. The animation system in this game, is, is this the first thing that you work on when you, when you build the game? Yes. Animation is really the most important thing for the kind of games that we make. The first Ninja Gaiden was a game where it was fun to control the high boosters because it had so many different animations. In Ninja Gaiden 2, of course, we're keeping that intact, but we're also showing how cool the enemy's animations and movements are and how many different variations of ways that you can kill them. In the previous game, you could decapitate enemies, but that's as far as it went. In Ninja Gaiden 2, you're going to not only be able to decapitate, but you can also lop off a left arm, you can lop off a right arm, you can even cut off legs because you're going to see all these uh, different ways uh, of defeating them with all these new animations uh, and uh, cool uh, attacks. Well, while we're on the topic of taking body parts off one piece at a time, um, mm. obviously this game is definitely a step up in the blood count from the original Ninja Gaiden. Mm. Did you plan to have the original Ninja Gaiden be this over the top bloody, mm. or is this something that you'd only decided to do with Ninja Gaiden 2? I think it's a little bit of both. When I was doing the original Ninja Gaiden, you know, I had to make a choice. Do I use resources on, uh, you know, creating these violent uh, elements, or do I use resources on refining the, the core gameplay elements? But this time around, the key concept from the beginning is we're going to do violence, we're going to do it over the top, and go as far as we can. I've just been kind of, you know, shooting for the horizon. On just uh, my uh, myself as a creator, what I do is just over the top. I just take it too far with everything I do. Thank you so much, Odagaki san It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and congratulations on the game. Thank you. We still won't see Ninja Gaiden 2 for a little while, so it's best to distract yourself with other titles. Whether you do it by mail or in person, rending games will do the trick and save you the trouble of an eventual trade-in. In today's X-List, we have the top five game rentals. At number five, we find Kingdom Under Fire Circle of Doom. Asking 60 bucks for this game? That is too much. Asking 10 bucks for a week? That's more reasonable. Number four is the game that Fox News loves to hate and give factually incorrect reports on. Mass Effect. We all know the kids are renting it for the penetration shots. Number three is Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, which is a great rental if you're too poor to buy it. In at number two is Assassin's Creed. We can't re recommend the enemy of the poor achievement enough. Get a job, you bum! And number one is the sandbox racer that's going to keep virtual body shops in business for a long time. Burnout Paradise. All right, stay right there. We've got answers to your questions, survival tactics, and everything that will focus your ADD for a half hour. Coming up on X-Play, Kristen Holt will help you master Call of Duty 4's veteran difficulty in today's Chief. Then, we go on location to check out Tiberium, the latest chapter in the Command & Conquer saga. And later, Penny Arcade comes to a console near you. Stay tuned. With games that just came out like Mass Effect and the soon-to-be uh, T-Human, is this how we're going to start seeing our RPGs playing out? Uh, more free action, move about, and instead of turn-based? Welcome back to X-Play. Thanks for your question, Brady. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think this definitely is. I think the am amazing success of Mass Effect is just testament yes. to that. Uh, people really gravitate towards this because it's really more appealing to most gamers out there. It's just more accessible. I think turn-based is hard for people to kind of pick up and grasp if they don't have the basis for it. But, you know, there's always the handhelds. They're going to be where you're going to find your turn-based And there's Sid Meier. You know, I guess that's strategy. But still, if you need your turn-based, you can't do better than that. All right. And remember, if you're really thirsty for turn-based gameplay, Square Enix will be there to give you a remake uh, every six months or so. But now let's get into some frantic non-stop combat. Since Call of Duty 4's achievements don't cover multiplayer, you're going to need to beat the single-player game on Veteran for that perfect score. Thankfully, Christian Holt is here with a few tips in today's cheat. Thanks, Morgan. I know it might seem impossible to make it out of the TV station intact, but believe it or not, there's a way. Before you smash your controller in frustration, check out these strategies for survival. Call of Duty 4's veteran difficulty can be a bit 
um, overwhelming at times. One of the keys to victory is understanding when a bad guy is going to pop out and when a good guy is going to help out. Exhibit A, the infamous TV station. This room goes downhill in a hurry. Once you cross these lines, enemies will spawn in the offices and a gang of terrorists will head out of this hallway, which is, unfortunately, your destination. Rather than heading towards the offices and their illusion of cover, try this route. Turn right when you enter the station and break for that small closet in the corner. If you're feeling extra mean, flash bang the hallway and pick off a few tangos before you hide. The advantage in here is that enemies rarely rush you and grenades are very easy to toss back from this tiny space. As they try to get to your position, your silly teammates will slowly pick off most of the terrorists. After four or five minutes, when the shooting starts to die down, peek your head out and move towards the hallway for that sweet, sweet checkpoint. Another tough level is Safe House. We are ordered to advance up a hill, searching each house along the way for some big shot bad guy. This would be easy if each house wasn't filled with several hundred scumbags. There's our next house. Once again, the trick is to find a spot that will pull your lazy wingmen up and let them do your dirty work. The back door seems pretty busy, so we'll try the front door. Looks like our simple-minded buddies will follow us up here, but there's still too much heat coming out of this door. How about under the deck? Hmm, seems safe, but where are homies at? Let's try against the front wall. So far, so good. We'll tuck this guy in and, hey, the gang's all here. Happy to see you idiots as always. If you continue to play smart, be patient, and always wear your necklace made of rabbit's feet, you too will be a Call of Duty 4 veteran. Hey, if the AI can be cheap, then so can you. Be sure to check out g4tv.com slash cheat for the latest tips and tricks. Right now, I'm gonna send it back over to Morgan. Thank you, Kristen. Now we have to take a quick break, but when X-Play comes back, we go on location to check out Tiberium, which is a first-person shooter set in the Command & Conquer world. Then we've got a preview of the Penny Arcade game, which promises to be smart-assy. But first, let's take a look at Call of Duty 4's fastest recruits in today's leaderboard. Welcome back to X-Play. Last year, Electronic Arts gave us the four-star RTS Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars. This year, they're back, protecting us from a sprint invasion with the first-person shooter Tiberium, the first since Command & Conquer Renegade. We want a location to EA for a closer look. We recently got a chance to talk with the people behind the scenes of Tiberium, which means to you faithful viewers, go the spoils. Tiberium is a science fiction first person shooter where uh, squad control is a big part of the game. So your arsenal of weapons includes a transforming weapon we call the GD-10, but you also have squads of infantry, missile teams, aircraft in the form of Orca, close air support craft, and Titan walkers, which are big armored units. And those are also weapons at your disposal. It's set in the Tiberium universe, which is inspired by the original Command & Conquer game. What we're doing with it is really taking players into the heart of that Tiberium mythology. It's a world that's been transformed by the discovery of this powerful resource called Tiberium. It's an alien material, it spreads like cancer, it's radioactive, and it's really become the new oil. It's divided the planet, and that's really the source of the conflict in the Tiberium universe. And we're going to put players in the role of Ricardo Vega, who's a forward battle commander. He's basically a man on the mission to solve the riddle of the last tower. But what sets Tiberium apart from other games? So one of the things that's really unique about Tiberium is you can take multi-squad combat into multiplayer. So, you know, it's not just you and against a bunch of uh, players, it's you against players and their squads. 
and their Titan Max and their Orcas and their missile teams and so forth, and you're doing the same thing. And so it really you know, changes the landscape a little bit when every player also has these NPCs under their control. They also went to great lengths to create a distinct sound for the game. The audio design uh, for Tiberium is really based on the idea of it being epic sci-fi. We wanted to create a world that was different but deep, something that had signature sound and style to it, so when you heard them out of context, you would go, oh, that's a sound from Tiberium. We wanted to make sure that each of the sounds were homogenous, like they, they all felt like they were part of the same family and coming up with the right transition sounds and everything. It has been you know, a lot of experimentation, but the thing that's great about it is it's sort of a great foundation to work with. Not only does the sound design kind of shift based on the environment that you're in, but the music scored very differently for each of those different things. So when we get into the Nod territories, it brings in a lot of interesting ethnic instruments. It kind of has the more mystical kind of feel like you would expect Nod to have, whereas GDI is much more straight ahead military kind of feel and aliens are chaotic and ambiguous and strange and things that you just feel like you would never heard before. And if you're still not clear on what Tiberium is exactly, that's okay. They're getting to it. We want to start telling the reason and the being for Tiberium. Basically show people why Tiberium's there and, and what it means in the future. But perhaps you think it's too late to jump on the Tiberium train. Well you'd be wrong. There's no time like the present. It could be a fresh entry point. If you haven't played a game in the Tiberium universe before, this is a great opportunity to do it because we are introducing a new player character. If you're a fan of the franchise already, you'll be able to get in and kind of learn a deeper story. So get ready for Tiberium, and don't forget to pick up your hazmat suit from the cleaner. Coming up, Penny Arcade's Gabe and Tycho star in a game all their own. We preview on the rain-slit precipice of darkness when X-Play returns. X-Play presents GDC 08. Come along as Adam and Morgan uncover the very latest in gaming. X-Play from the GDC starts February 18th, only on G4. This show also available on G4 On Demand. Welcome back to X-Play. For years, the webcomic Penny Arcade has been keeping the gaming industry honest. But now Gabe and Tycho are poised to be sucked into the very machine they mock. As a game based on Penny Arcade is set to be released later this year. It's called Penny Arcade Adventures on the Rain Slick Precipice of Darkness, Episode 1. And we've got a preview. If you talk about video games long enough, eventually you have to make one. That's just what the guys at PennyArcade.com are hatching with their debut title, Penny Arcade Adventures on the Rain Slick Precipice of Darkness, Episode 1. Game producer Joel DeYoung gives us the lowdown on Gabe, Tycho, and an adventure almost as epic as its name is long. Tycho said a little while back, you know, if they were to consider making a game about two guys sitting on a couch playing video games, it doesn't make for the most exciting game story. So the story takes place in the 1920s in a Lovecraftian kind of steampunk style world where Gabe and Tycho run a detective agency. With the concept so far removed from what fans have come to expect from Penny Arcade, a lot of collaboration between Gabe and Tycho and the team at Hothead Games was essential. Our primary goal when we started working on this and all the way along has been that this is an authentically Penny Arcade experience. So we work extremely closely with the guys at Penny Arcade on this game. Tycho is on the phone with our lead designer talking about dialogue and Gabe has done all the art direction. As far as getting the game out to players, Penny Arcade and Hothead see that as yet another opportunity to break with tradition. On the Rain Slick Precipice of Darkness is the name for the entire game series and there is a, a plan for a large story arc that runs the entire length of the game series. Our goal is to get a new episode out every four months or so. A final note to all the Penny Arcade fanboys out there, if you're ready to complain, and we know you are, Hothead is ready to listen. Will there be things people don't like? I'm sure there will be, and you know, we're committed to listening to that and responding to it. Doing it episodically actually offers advantages there. You know, we release the first episode, we'll hear that feedback, and there's opportunities to incorporate uh, changes into future episodes. Your downloadable slide down the rain slick precipice begins this spring. 
You can always check out X-Play on the go with our lovely portable podcast. Just go to g4tv.com slash xplay or search for xplay on iTunes. All right. We are out of time for today, but yep. be sure to join us in prime time tomorrow night at 8 on our next show. We preview Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword and find out if this handheld DS adventure is as bloody and fun as its big brother. And then Pro Gamer T Squared is back with some more Halo 3 tips that'll have your friends begging for mercy. And we'll talk to the developers behind Devil May Cry 4 and see what it took to bring the latest chapter to consoles. And in just a few short weeks, we'll have all the coverage of the Game Developers Conference that you could ever want. X-Play will be on site to get you every detail on the latest innovations at gaming's first big event of the year. We will have exclusive interviews, breaking news, and all the highlights of the keynotes. So if you want to know anything and everything about GDC, tune into X-Play starting February 18th, only on G4. Well, that should be good. I, yeah. I, I think I think one final note on the whole, you know, Fox News, you know, issue and all that. Um, right. It would appear, and I want to believe Kotaku on this, that in a correspondence with Brian Crescente, Jack Thompson himself doesn't think that this Mass Effect thing is that big a deal. I mean... And he hates everything! Exactly! Thanks for See watching. See you tomorrow. X-Play, TV's most watched video game show. Today on X-Play, we preview Devil May Cry 4, meet our new protagonist Nero, and unleash some sick combos with Dante. Pro Gamer T-Squared drops in with more tips and strategies to keep you alive in Halo 3. Plus, we go head-to-head -to, -head to break down the controversial lawsuit between Silicon Knights and Epic Games. All this and much more. It's game time. the center of the gaming universe. I'm Morgan Webb. And I'm Adam Sessler. We're coming to you from the G4 studios in Los Angeles on Tuesday, January 29th. On today's show, we will give you a reason to stop playing Sudoku and pick cross when we show you our preview of Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword for the DS. Plus, you might be able to back up your trash talk after Pro Gamer T Squared gives you some tips on mastering Halo 3. Then we talk to the minds behind Devil May Cry 4 and preview Capcom's Demon Slayer while trying to keep our combos going. And we'll go head to head with our gaming colleagues to discuss the heated lawsuit over the Unreal Engine 3 and what Silicon Knights' legal action could mean for the industry. But first, let's go over to Morgan for all of today's gaming headlines in our gaming update. Thanks, Adam. CNET Networks has named Ricardo Torres as GameSpot's new editor-in-chief. The announcement comes in the wake of the unsubstantiated internet controversy regarding the site's review for Kane and Lynch, Dead Men, and the departure of industry veteran and former co-editorial director Jeff Gertzman. Former site lead Greg Kasavin left the site last January, leaving GameSpot without an official editor-in-chief throughout 2007 and into 2008. In a recent press release, Ricardo said that he's eager to continue the site's tradition of excellence and is confident the site can move forward into 2008 and set a new industry standard for how video games are covered. Sony has announced an official release date for Gran Turismo 5 Prologue. This PlayStation 3 exclusive will hit store shelves April 17th and will also be available for download via the PlayStation Network. Now, the game is going to cost $40 and will feature 37 cars, 10 different circuits, and best of all, will be playable online. Gamers who purchased a copy of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas that was manufactured before July 20th, 2005, may have come across modified content that eventually became known as Hot Coffee. As a result of a class action lawsuit, gamers who feel they were offended by this content can request a cash refund in varied amounts up to $35. Now, the amount you receive depends on the details of your original purchase and whether or not you have an original store receipt. Who does? Those interested should visit gtasettlement.com. 
In following up on the recent Mass Effect controversy, Hal Halpin, president of the Entertainment Consumers Association, is asking Fox News to retract the inaccuracies of their statements. When reached for comment, the ECA told X-Play, quote, This is nothing new to us, but it is both unfair and inaccurate. And as news media, we believe that falsehoods should be corrected. Fox has an editorial responsibility to correct the story, and it is our hope that they will do so in a timely manner. Later that day, on Fox News anchor Martha McCullum acknowledged the controversy, saying, quote, Last week we aired a segment about a video game called Mass Effect. There has been some criticism from the gaming community about the segment, end quote. She then went on to read Cooper Lawrence's New York Times statement, where Lawrence admitted her lack of knowledge in regards to the game and regrets over her comments. McCullum then extended Fox News' standing invitation to Bioware and Electronic Arts to appear on the show. When we contacted Fox News for further comment, they only reiterated their invitation to the parties involved. It is worth noting that some of the misstated facts on the Fox News segment did not originate with Mrs. Lawrence. Be sure to visit us at g4tv.com slash xplay where you'll continue to find all of today's up to the minute video game news. Now let's go over to Adam who is patiently waiting to show us a stealthy new handheld game. Thank you, Morgan. Well, most people would agree that ninjas are really fun, but it's a bummer that they don't come in tiny travel size. Well, all that's about to change as Ninja Gaiden comes to the DS. Who says deadly things don't come in small packages? Check out this preview of Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword. Nice move. Damn, Ninja, how'd you do that on a DS? That's right, it's Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword, and it's on the Nintendo DS. Before you expectorate in the general vicinity of anybody that might reduce the lightless fabric of gaming's reigning ninja, realize that Dragon Sword is no paltry port. In order to bring the complexity of Gaiden's combat engine to the handheld, Team Ninja decided to ask for your help. So grab your sword, or in this case your stylus. Difficulty ramps up at a satisfying pace as you develop your skills to face different sets of adversaries and bosses. Backgrounds are pre-rendered, but characters themselves are in 3D and move around each other with involving depth. As we mentioned before, gameplay is stylus heavy. Place and hold it on the screen to guide your hero's movement. Naturally, the game's realm is filled with all manners of eccentric advice and gift giver. As you acquire Ryu's Nimpo magic, you'll need to trace an on-screen letter to trigger it. Throw shuriokens by tapping on that living part of the screen you need dead. There's even a section with a sleeping guy you'll need to jar awake by saying something into the DS mic. Very clever, Ninja. We look forward to your red bloom sometime in the spring. Coming up on X-Play, don't miss our preview of Devil May Cry 4. Then, get out your briefs. We go head-to-head -to, -head to talk about the Silicon Knights lawsuit. Plus, we take some batting practice and preview MLP 08. Stay tuned. Why do you think the EverQuest didn't make it as big as World of Warcraft. They came out a week apart. EverQuest had a bigger fan base. Welcome back to X-Play, and thank you for your question. Uh, it's, it's a good question, but yeah. I think it comes down to WoW is just that much more accessible. Well, it had like a new name, but you, you didn't think you were just going to get bogged down by the players who've been playing for 15 years. It can't even that long. But it, it was a new thing, and everyone's like, I can, I can get into this. And it looked really good, and I think that leads to the fact that why so many women like to play the game is yeah. it doesn't look like a Frank Frazetta poster. It's, it's a little more open to everyone. Well, if you are sick of being target practice for your friends, you might want to listen up. Pro Gamer T Squared is back with some more tips on Halo 3. What's up? This is Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor. But you may know me as T Squared. T Squared. I'm a member of the MLG Pro team, Straight Ripping. I have the Halo 3 tips. Halo 3 that will have you fragging like a pro. In Halo 3, exploring the map is imperative. You gotta find new jumps, new hiding spots. I got a couple for Guardian right now. This spot here is useful for anyone that's coming up on you on long ramp. On this jump right here, you're wedging yourself in the side of the room. It's hard to master, but the reward is huge. Wait for them to run past you and give them the beat down. Kill joy. 
This next jump is when you're top center. Wait for the person to come around blue, jump off the map, land on this ledge. It's gonna look like you fell off, but instead he's getting the beat down again. Killing spree. This next jump is one of the hardest in Halo 3. You're gonna start blue one and end up blue two. How you do this jump is line yourself up with the tree. You're gonna jump, wedge yourself into the tree, and then get onto the ramp to the right and come behind the enemy. He's never gonna know what hit him. This is one of my favorite jumps. You're gonna start on long ramp going to snipe one. The guy's running bottom center and he's never gonna know I came behind him. Once again, upping my teabag count. All these jumps take practice, practice, practice. They're not just gonna come to you. You'll be a sneaky McSneakerson in no time. In case you haven't already heard, Dante's out and Nero is in. And no, I'm not talking about fashion. I'm talking about Double May Cry 4. Find out what other surprises are in store for Hack and Slash fans in this preview. We recently got a chance to speak with developer Hiroyuki Kobayashi about the newest installment in the Devil May Cry series. Do you want to this? Uh, in this game we have a new hero, his name is Nero, and in addition to the sword and gun gameplay that we've had in the series up until now, he also has a, a third action that he can use, and that is the Devilbringer. The Devilbringer is Nero's demonic right arm, and there are a lot of different things he can do uh, with this arm, like he can grab things that are far away from him, and he can also use it to move around certain parts. Uh, of the various levels in the game. As the story goes along, one of the things that Nero is able to do is he was able to bring out his demonic form. Unlike Dante's Devil Trigger, his appearance itself doesn't change, but this demon appears behind him, and this allows him to do double attacks. And even though Dante isn't the star of the game, he hasn't been forgotten. Early on in the game, he first appears uh, as an enemy and as Nero you have to fight him, but as the story goes on you understand what he's doing uh, in Fortuna and then later on in the game you change to play uh, as Dante. And he's still got some moves. Dante has three special weapons. The first weapon I'll tell you about is uh, Gilgamesh. It's a weapon that allows Dante to do a bunch of martial arts moves. The second weapon is called Lucifer. This is a really cool weapon that allows Dante to shoot these swords out into the air and they hang in the air or you can stick them in enemies. You can have them hang around. The third weapon that we have is called Pandora. Uh, when you're carrying it, it looks just like a regular suitcase, but actually it can change into a bunch of different weapons. And there's more new content than you can shake a devil bringer at. In the current game market, you really have to do something, you know, bigger and better than things we've done before. It was important that this game was accessible to all walks of gamers. People who are good at games, people who are bad at games, people who are new to the series, and people who are fans of the series, I think everyone will have something to enjoy. So, stay tuned for Devil May Cry 4. It's an equal opportunity game. When X-Play comes back, we go head-to-head -to, -head to analyze the Silicon Knights' legal action. And then we've got a preview of MLB 08 on deck. But first, let's take a look at who dominates defense in Pixel Junk Monsters. Here are the players with the best score on Shortcut in today's leaderboard. Welcome back to X-Play. As you may know, back in July, a lawsuit was filed by Silicon Knights, developers of the game Too Human, against Epic Games, creators of the Unreal Engine and developers of Gears of War. Due to the widespread application of this engine throughout the industry and the potential impact this case could have, we thought we'd shed a little light on the subject. Get ready to go head to head. My guests tonight are Editor-in-Chief for IGN Xbox, Hillary Goldstein. Also joining us, Executive Editor for Electronic Gaming Monthly, Shane Bettenhausen. Well, welcome gentlemen, thanks for joining us. So Shane, let's just start off with you. Would you mind kind of giving a small breakdown of the various reasons behind the initial lawsuit from Silicon Knights against Epic Games? Well, Silicon Knights licensed the Unreal Engine 3.0 tech from Epic, and you know, they spent a lot of money on it, and they, and they were developing the game to human, they realized the engine was not complete, it impacted the delay of the game, the game was delayed, so now they're suing to recoup their losses and try to make right on this, uh, this problem. Now, uh, Hillary, um, there was a countersuit filed by Epic Games against Silicon Knights right following the initial lawsuit. What are the details behind that particular action? 
Well, from what we understand of this lawsuit from uh, Epic is basically that uh, Silicon Knights decided that they were going to kind of build their own engine after the failures with uh, the Unreal Engine. And so Epic is basically saying that Silicon Knights has not paid them properly and that the Silicon Knights engine itself uses too many parts of the Unreal 3 engine, which is kind of part of what is happening with a new part of the suit that just came in uh, yesterday where Silicon Knights is trying to keep Epic from actually being able to look at their source code to make certain that there aren't uh, too many parts of the Unreal 3 engine being used now for 2Human. All right, now uh, we, we, we started moving to the world of esoteria right there. Uh, we use the word engine so much, but what is it exactly that the Unreal 3 engine is and what it offers to these people that license it out, Shane? Well, I mean, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's it's the basic framework for building a game. Everything from the graphics you're seeing to the environments to the characters. It's basically a set of tools that easily allows a developer to create a good-looking game. I mean, we've seen a lot of games come out using the Unreal Engine, but you haven't seen games that look as good as the games that Epic makes. And that's kind of what Silicon Knights is getting at here, that they think that Epic has, like, you know, a special relationship with their own engine that no one else can, can make games of that quality with. Um, now, 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 Hillary, um, also I think an element of the Unreal Engine is that it's not just like one big chunk that everyone gets that you plug in. It is something that obviously other developers get to play with. Um, do you have a better understanding of how that aspect of it works? Uh, no, I don't, because the only thing I'm able to develop is strained rashes on my body. But uh, what I do know is that it is a multi-purpose tool set and that but kind of what we understand is that you actually can license different parts of the tools because in part of this suit we found out that Silicon Knights actually paid $750,000 uh, to license the Unreal Engine. Back to what Shane said though, I, I would actually say that one of the reasons why uh, Epic is probably good at using the Gears of War is because, or, you know, a game like Gears of War or Unreal Tournament is because they know that engine better than anybody else ever will. They know how to use that tool set, they know how to maximize it, whereas, you know, everybody else is just sort of renting it out. Obviously, it's not just Silicon Knights that's using the Unreal Engine. So many companies and developers out there are using Unreal technology. Um, why is it so appealing and why does everyone seem to want to keep on going back and use it? Shane? Well, you know, it was one of the best looking graphic sets we saw a few years ago. It was easy to use, it was affordable, you know, it seemed like a good solution for next-gen development that would allow developers, especially with multi-platform development, to create good looking games. But that's part of the problem, and the part of this lawsuit is the PlayStation 3 version of this engine, which Silicon Knights also licensed, is, was not complete. And so far only one game has shipped, and you know, that's Midway's uh, Unreal Tournament 3 that uses this engine, and a lot of games have been canceled because Silicon Knights was unable to finish that engine, and that's, that's a big part of this lawsuit as well. Um, and then one last question, Hillary. Um, right now, do you see this as any type of threat to other companies that are using the Unreal technology, the fact that this lawsuit might somehow slow their development cycle? Uh, we know that uh, there have been a few subpoenas that have gone out to other developers that are asking, uh, who have used the uh, license, the Unreal Engine, asking to uh, see their code, to talk about them about this experience. So we know that that probably is going to take some time because you're going to have to go into court, give a deposition. Uh, so and you know when you talk about when we talk about source code, we're talking about the actual building pieces for your game, and people are very protective of those kind of things because they are easy for other programmers to rip those things off. So I do think it, it could maybe slow some people down, but honestly, I don't think this is going to have a major impact on the industry. We really hope it doesn't. Guys, thank you so much, but that is all the time that we have. Hillary and Shane, thank you again for joining us. And stay right there. X-Play will be back right after this. Up next on X-Play, grab your HGH and an asterisk for the record books. We've got a preview of MLB 08 on the way. Don't move. Welcome back to X-Play. Winter is a wasteland for baseball fans. If you miss the crack of the bat, smell the fresh cut grass, and the needle tracks on your favorite player's arm, there's only one thing to do. Pick up a video game like this one. Here's our preview of MLB 08. Ah, the week before Super Bowl. Sports fans are football crazy, and that makes this the perfect time to check out the latest baseball extravaganza, MLB 08 The Show. This ball is a home run. I don't want 
to say where we obtained this preview, but let's just say a quote New York Mets clubhouse attendant unquote slipped it into my bag. No questions asked. Baseball games rarely change all that much from year to year, but we hear MLB 08 The Show is going to be even deeper than previous games in this series. You get special bonus points for consistent hitting. The higher ups call it a progressive batting performance. Over the wall, home run. And if you fall into a slump, or if you're no Mar Garcia Para, a three year slump, penalties will come your way. Nice play for the first down. And just like 07, the announcing is the same, led by the colorful Rex Hudler. As you are so fond of saying, yeah! Rex Hudler, as you all know, was arrested at a Kansas City airport because he had a little bit of the leafy green on his person, prescribed, of course, by a doctor. Time to ask for a new rock. MLB 08 The Show is slated to testify before Congress in just a few months. We'll tell you even more about this field of dreams then. Now it's gonna be a home run. And then, and only then, will there be joy in Mudville. But this one had more than enough to get out of here. If hunting big game and Cabela's African safari just isn't cutting it anymore, you might want to think about a more formidable foe, like raptors. Terror Rock will be unleashed into stores on February 5th, but we have the latest trailer for you now. Make sure to tune in this Friday when we'll have a review of Turok. Now we are out of time today, but we'll be back tomorrow at 8 p.m. with an all-new show. If you love shooting hoods and keeping your multiplier up, then tune in for our exclusive hands-on demo of The Club. Plus, Kristen Holt will come by with a cheat that will help you finally find all those pesky flags in Assassin's Creed. I need that cheat. And we'll have a review of Res HD as well as sit down with the game's mastermind, Tetsuya Mizuguchi. And be sure to join us this February when we head up to San Francisco to bring you five days of on-site coverage from the Game Developers Conference. X-Play will be there to get you every detail on the latest innovations at gaming's first big event of the year. We're going to have exclusive interviews, breaking news, and all the highlights of the keynote. So, to get the inside track on GDC, tune into X-Play starting February 18th, only on G4. It's going to be cold up there. It is, but it's going to be great. Lots of games, yes. and we're going to see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. Play the center of the gaming universe. Today on X Play, we've got an exclusive hands on with the club, a frantic arcade shooter from the creators of Project Gotham Racing. Plus, we go on location with creator Mizuguchi to get the latest on Res HD and find out what new challenges are in store. And in today's cheat, Kristen Holt helps you attain perfection in Assassin's Creed and get every last achievement. Watch your back, it's game time. Welcome to X Play, TV's most watched video game show. I'm Adam Sessler. And I'm Morgan Webb. We're coming to you from the G4 Studios in Los Angeles on Wednesday, January 30th. On today's show, if you like the idea of Project Gotham Racing with Guns, then you'll probably want to see our exclusive hands on demo of The Club. Then, if you're a slut for achievement points, we'll show you what sports games to play and which ones to avoid, where next play takes a closer look at achievement tours. Plus, we go on location with Mizuguchi to talk about the new and improved high def version of Res and why you might want to play with three controllers. And in today's cheat, Kristen Holt will show you how to pull off the real challenge in Assassin's Creed, finding all those freaking flags. But first, let's go over to Adam, who has all of the day's top stories in our gaming update.
Thank you, Morgan. Well, Tecmo, the Japanese developer of the Fatal Frame series, has announced that a Wii version of the game is currently in development. Despite its mature subject matter, Nintendo is publishing the title and intends to actively promote the game's release. Even more interesting is the announcement that Suda51, X-Play's current love child and creator of No More Heroes, will be involved with the project, working as one of the game's directors. Valve recently announced that a publishing and game development tool set called Steamworks is available as a free download via Steam. This software provides publishers and developers tools that enable voice chat, auto updating, and stat tracking. Also included is the multiplayer backend and matchmaking services that were created to support games like Counter-Strike and Team Fortress 2. Best of all, Steamworks provides a state-of-the-art encryption system that will prevent people from pirating a game before it's released. Now, Crytek, the German-based developer of Crisis, is planning to give console demonstrations of their CryEngine 2 middleware at this year's Game Developers Conference. This will be Crytek's first public demonstration of their technology on a platform other than the PC. So it's no surprise that this news adds fuel to the rumor that Crisis will be ported to the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360. Crytek also plans to demo the CryEngine 2 on a $600 PC to help prove that their technology can be an affordable and reasonable option for developers, as well as gamers who can't afford a Blackbird, me included. Ubisoft has released new downloadable content for the Xbox 360 version of Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter 2. Dubbed the Co-op Collection, the pack includes a total of nine maps and five new co-op missions, continuing the story and giving players a chance to quell the enemy uprising in South America and hunt down their rebel leaders. The download costs 800 Microsoft points and is available for download right now. Be sure to visit our website for a full look at this brand new co-op collection trailer. Point your browser to g4tv.com slash xplay where you'll also continue to get all of today's up to the minute video game news. But now, let's go over to Morgan who is ready to help increase your pitiful Xbox Live Gamer Store. Thanks, Adam. Now, if achievements tip the scale when you're buying a multi-platform title, then you should probably listen up. Sometimes it's hard to tell what sports games will give up a thousand points easy and which ones will fight you tooth and nail. Our crack team has compiled a report to help X-Play investigate achievement whores. This week, in honor of that big football matchup that's coming, you know, that super game that takes place in a bowl-shaped stadium, we present the Super Special X-Play Investigates Achievement Horrors Sports Edition. Here are the best and worst sports games guaranteed to score you some gamer points. Madden 08 is so easy, you don't even have to play the game to get most of the thousand points available. Step 1. Select Play Now and pick a good team for yourself. Set the difficulty to Rookie. Step 2. After the kickoff hit start, and select Super Sim. Step three, sit back and let the gamer points roll in. Next up, we have Fight Night Round 3. All you have to do for 1,000 easy points is win each of the sponsored fights. After winning the ESPN pay-per-view fight, the Burger King Invitational, and the Under Armour fight, you won't just be a consumer whore, you'll be an achievement whore. But for every pushover game against the Miami Dolphins, you have to play against the unstoppable Hellspawn juggernaut that is the New England Patriots. Or say, NHL 08. Sure, some of us like hockey. But wait till you see what EA expects you to do. How about trying to score as the goalie in superstar mode? Who the hell thought that shooting the puck through the line of burly French-Canadian defenders from somewhere behind the red line would be easy? Goalie's out. He'll get the extra player on the ice. Another way to net 25 frustrating points is trying to beat an NHL team with an AHL team on Superstar. Ten. In the end, all those gamer points don't get you anything. But you're an achievement whore, and that's worth far more than any material reward for you. Me, I take the material reward any day. Now there's a total of 5,000 points available in today's X list of top selling Xbox 360 games. Whether you'll get them, well, that's another story. Number five is Lost Odyssey, which is available for pre-order. The game contains four discs. Apparently, Miss Walker thought they had cut things short in Blue Dragon. Coming in at number four is Guitar Hero 3, and it's really hard to act surprised that it's selling well. At number three is Devil May Cry 4, which proves that angry fanboy petitions really don't mean much. Just ahead of that is another fork called Call of Duty 4. 
It's the new home of trash talking on Xbox Live. And at number one is Burnout Paradise. Don't let the demo and the changes scare you away. The game is great with friends, and be sure to hook up your vision camera for extra fun. All right, stay right there. X-Play will be back with flags, headshots, and hypnotic music right after this break. Coming up on X-Play, we join the club and go hands-on for an exclusive look at how to become the fastest killer around. Then, get ready to free run. We show you how to find all of Assassin's Creed's secrets. And we go on location to talk with Mizuguchi, the mastermind behind Res HD. Stay tuned. Welcome back to X-Play. In order to be a successful assassin, there are a few things you'll absolutely need. Things like knives, cat-like reflexes, and flags. Yes, flags. Confused? Christian Holt is here to explain. Thanks, Adam. In Assassin's Creed, killing your targets doesn't pose too difficult of a challenge. Finding flags is a whole nother story. To get you started on the right foot, here's how you track down the first in today's cheat. If you enjoyed Where's Waldo, then you'll love hidden flags in Assassin's Creed. There's over 300 of these suckers to find on your Xbox 360, and each set unlocks valuable achievement points to boost your gamer score. In the first area of the game, Masyaf, there are 20 flags to collect. Some are more difficult to find than others, but don't sweat it guys, I know where to find those really tough ones. After you're stripped of your rank and special weapons, you'll be able to collect the Assassin flags. Most of the flags can be found scattered throughout the village in more obvious locations, on rooftops, around corners, and behind buildings. But some of the harder flags to uncover are right under your nose. At the Assassin's base, you'll find several flags around the castle. There's one inside the main hall in the back by the bookcases, as well as one in the nearby courtyard out front. Once you grab this one outside the main gates, take the ladder to your right. Here you'll find another flag by the window. Pick it up and head over to the wooden planks. Jump off into the pile of hay and go across the first balance beam. Check by the ledge and get yourself another flag. After climbing the wall to get back to the castle, you'll discover another flag tucked away after jumping down by the edge of this rock. Now you'll be ready to head down to the village and collect the rest of your remaining flags. If you find yourself stuck on 18 out of 20 flags, don't worry, you're on the right track. The last two flags can only be obtained after assassinating your first target, Tamir. Head to Damascus and speak with the Assassin Bureau leader and then find Tamir. Once you eliminate the target, you'll end up back at the castle in Masyaf. But this time, a new gate has opened up inside that allows you to roam the courtyard out back. Here you'll find the two remaining flags. One is on a column in the middle of a little pool with the final flag hiding in the corner just a few steps away. Now if I could only find where I put my car keys. For even more tips and tricks, head on over to g4tv.com slash cheat. Let's go back over to Morgan. Thanks, Kristen. Now, next play comes back. We've got an exclusive hands-on with the club. And I'm not talking about auto theft prevention devices. Then we check out Res HD and sit down with this designer. But first, let's check out who packs the most punch when it comes to puzzles. On today's leaderboard for Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix. Do you think Salt Snake will die in the fourth Metal Gear Solid? And if not, do you think they'll continue on with the series? Welcome back to X Play, and thank you for your question, Neo Snake. I th I think Snake's already dead. Yeah, exactly. He's, I mean, he he's, might he's you know he's animated with nano machines. Exactly. I'll probably I, cannot I, be right. <laughs> even, I think the thing is, he could very well die in this. Remember, this yeah. is Metal Gear Solid that could put a, a vampire in, 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 you know, Sons of Liberty. So pretty much he could die and just resurrect for another game. Uh, of course, they say this might be the last game, though. Yeah, but they always love to tease that. Exactly. This could be the last. This is your last chance to buy this. You better buy two copies. Yeah, I think three was at one point going to be the last <laughs> game as well. So it's not. I, I wouldn't worry too much there, buddy. <laughs> if you ever have any questions for us, please don't be shy. We want to hear all your thoughts, concerns, and interrogative statements used to test knowledge. Just log on to g4tv.com slash xplay and send us your video viewer mails. You supply the questions. 
We supply something like an answer. We don't guarantee quality. No. We just guarantee existence. Now, if there's one thing I love on cold winter evenings like this, it's blood sports. You know the sound of my 45 echoing off the vacant warehouse walls, the satisfying crack of my opponent's bones, and tea. I also like tea a lot. But if you enjoy brutal pastimes like myself, you might want to join the club. Sega is here to go hands-on with their new point-based first-person shooter. Bizarre Creations are known for their popular Project Gotham racing series. The latest title, The Club, centers on a group of eight criminals who are paid a great amount of money to participate in bloody gunfights. In this club, it's either you get rich or die trying. While the shooter may sound like a departure for Bizarre, its score-based arcade-like gameplay is something they know how to do very well. Joining us today from Sega, Ken Ogasawara. Thank you so much for stopping by. And of course, you brought us the club. How is this different from other shooters? Well, I mean, mm, what we're trying to do with the game is to make it into a real arcade experience. So, I mean, we want you to be running through a court real quickly, killing as many people as you can and doing it stylishly. So, how are you accomplishing that? Well, I mean, some of the things that we want to throw in there is that you've got a timer mm -hmm. counting down, you've got a multiplier that's counting down. Every time you get a kill, you get addition to the multiplier. So you need to get to another kill before that multiplier goes down. So it's really bad basically if you were running out of people to kill. Oh yeah, very much so. I mean, if you sit there and stop and hide, you're not going to get any points in the game. So there is no possibility of stealth action in this This game. is not meant to be stealth at all. It is run and gun all the way through. So every time you kill somebody, your multiplier is basically maintained. Maintained, yes, or keeps on going up. Okay, so what happens when your, multipli when your multiplier uh, goes down? Well, I mean, we call that a bleed out, and you're, it starts bleeding out real quickly to the point where, I mean, you get dropped down, the multiplier drops down all the way down to one again. Um, are you afraid that there's going to be any kind of backlash from <laughs> news outlets about killing people for points? Backlash on this? I mean, mm, <laughs> this is an arcade game, this is a video game, I mean, mm, not worried at all. I mean, this is meant to be entertaining. It's so out there, it's so fancy that, I mean, if people took this with any sort of reality, it'd be odd. <laughs> Sometimes people do odd things, but this is, it always and never ceases to amaze me. Um, this is a kind of a different kind of game for uh, Bizarre, the Project Gotham Racing, Geometry Wars. Um, how did this game really come about? Well, it is, yes, you've got, um, Bizarre has a racing pedigree, but they wanted to bring that experience to the FPS. They also wanted to have lots of shooting and explosions. So, in some of the way, it is an evolution from the racing game into the shooting genre, and they brought their spin to it. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about multiplayer. Um, how, what kind of modes are we going to see? Well, you're going to have some of really your standard modes, free for alls, and the um, death matches and whatnot. But the other thing that we wanted to do in this with the multiplayer, with the score attack, when you're doing one on or one against eight other players, okay. you're going to be trying to still do your stylish kills so that your multiplayer goes up. Another mode that we have is Hunted Hunted, where again the idea is one person is, we're playing reverse tag, one person, so as you get a kill you become the hunted and now you're the rabbit and you have to run while everybody else is trying to run you down. And what kind of things can you do to make your kill more stylish? Some of the things that you can do, I mean, well, headshots are the easy one, but... Headshots are always stylish. <laughs> but, mm, we want you to sit there and do rolls and then pop up and snap, do snapshots. We want you to do, do rick, uh, ricochets off walls to get kills. I mean, so there's a whole bunch that we have in there to do. And how many uh, players are we going to see online? Um, update people. Wow, that'll be a good time. <laughs> um, so what are some of the differences between the versions going to be? That for on the different consoles? Um, actually, just like on all the consoles, it's going to be the same game. It's just like we wanted to make sure that the experience, whether you're playing on the PlayStation 3, the Xbox 360, or okay. the PC, that it's all the same. Awesome. We can't wait. Thanks for coming by. The club is set for release on February 19th. X-Play will be back with more right after this. Up next on X-Play, we go on location with creator Mizuguchi to talk about Res HD, as well as review the long-awaited game. It all goes down in just a minute. X-Play presents GDC 08. Come along as Adam and Morgan uncover the very latest in gaming. X-Play from the GDC starts February 18th, only on G4.
Welcome back to X Play. Back in 2002, the musical rail shooter Rez had a small cult following on the PS2 and the Dreamcast. Well, now it's back, looking to make a comeback. And this time it's in HD and 5.1. We're taking a look at it in today's download. Those flashing lights, that pulsating music, that like totally zen feeling that you're one with all your senses, man. Put down your glow stick, you magnificent ravers, it's not 1993. And I'm not reviewing an old Moby album. This is Res HD. Res originally came out in 2002 for the PS2 to um, <clears throat> rave reviews. It's back now for the Xbox Live Arcade. The game is exactly the same as it was when you first fell into a Res trance six years ago. You play a futuristic hacker tasked with breaking into a futuristic computer program and preventing it from shutting down. In the future. Along the way, feel free to blow up any firewalls or viruses you encounter on the way in. Take that, McAfee! Sayonara, I love you, virus! Hasta la vista, bugbear! Res is famous for its use of synesthesia, or a simulation of multiple senses through one. All of the action and effects are set to trance music that becomes more intricate as you delve deeper into the program, so your character and enemies bump into the ever-increasing complexity of the beats. It'll set you back 800 points or 10 bucks, but that's a small price to pay for what you're getting. An immersive game, a thumping album of club music that you sort of control, a laser light show to rival anything at the planetarium, and all in glorious widescreen high def with surround sound. It's cheaper than a trip to Burning Man. If you are wondering what it took to get a unique game like this to see the light of day, then check out this on-location interview with the designer of Rez, Tatsuya Mizuguchi. Rez, one floating humanoid figure's musical vibrating journey into a virus-corrupted CPU. Is it as weird as it sounds? Yes, quite frankly. Is it also awesome? Yes, now even more so, as the world of Rez goes HD. Rez creator and game design visionary Tetsuya Mizuguchi fills us in on the strange and amazing world of Rez HD. So the Res is kind of a the new experience you know, using the visual and sound, even the vibration. The kind of a sensorama experience. I watch high def the visual, the power of you know involvement of you know the human senses is getting you know higher and higher, you know from eyes, ears, and whole senses. With sight, sound, and touch represented. There's only one more sense to satisfy, your sense of achievement. The my favor is uh, uh, resident. You have to clear uh, five all levels by 100% complete, and you have to get uh, all items, and uh, you can get the uh, secret character. I think it's really difficult to, you know, clear everything. Yeah, I think the, uh, it must be addictive, you know, for the people who love the, the res. Yeah, anyways, it'll be fun. Well, we're done for the day, but we'll be back tomorrow with an all-new X-Play for you at 8 p.m. And on our next show, we preview the Dino Field Turok, and we have a review of the new diving sim for the Wii Endless Ocean. Yes, you heard me right. Diving sim. Also, we go on location to a next-gen game store that seems like heaven. And we have a preview of Alone in the Dark. Now, I'm hoping this chapter finds you in more darkness and even a loner-er. I'm pretty sure that's not a word, a loner rumor. Coming up. But be sure to join us in February when we head up to San Francisco to bring you five days of on-site coverage from the Game Developers Conference. X-Play will be there to get you every detail on the latest innovations at gaming's first big event of the year. We'll have exclusive interviews, breaking news, and all the highlights of the keynotes. It's only a few weeks away, so if you want the inside track on GDC, tune in to X-Play starting February 18th only on G4. You don't want to miss it, and we will see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Play, TV's most watched video game show. Today on X Play, lock up your Raptors, we preview the latest game in the Turok series. And then our review of Endless Ocean will have you donning a virtual wetsuit. Plus, we preview the all new Alone in the Dark. It's creepy, it's immersive, it's back. All this and much more right now on X Play. It's game time. Hello 
And welcome to X Play, the center of the gaming universe. I'm Morgan Webb. And I'm Adam Sessler. We're coming to you from the G4 Studios in Los Angeles on Thursday, January 31st. Mm -hmm. On today's show, our dreams of dinosaur carnage are realized. Tarak is poised for his comeback, and we've got a preview. Plus, we review Endless Ocean, the diving sim for all you aquaphobes that you've all been waiting for. And remember, video games don't have to be limited to chainsaw kills and jiggle animations. Then we go on location to a video game store that actually respects the unwashed masses, which includes me. And we turn off the lights and tell all our friends to go home so we can preview Alone in the Dark. But first, let's go over to Morgan for all of today's headlines in our gaming update. Thanks, Adam. The 2007 Game Critics Awards have been announced, and the winner is 2K Boston's underwater utopian shooter, Bioshock. The Game Critics Awards are voted on by a group of the industry's leading game journalists, including x Play's own Adam Sessler. Following closely behind Bioshock's first place finish is the orange box from Valve. This five-game collection not only extended the Half-Life storyline, but also impressed gamers with its ingeniously designed puzzle shooter, Portal. Finally in at the number three spot is Infinity Ward's Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, which has already sold well over 7 million units worldwide. Now, just a reminder, Bioshock was X-Play's 2007 Game of the Year. We were right, as always. Rumors regarding Halo Wars have recently been shot down by Microsoft. Ensemble Studios' Halo-themed real-time strategy game was rumored to support cross-platform play between the Xbox 360 and the PC. New information from Microsoft has confirmed that despite speculation, there are currently no plans for a PC version of the game. Microsoft says the game is being developed from the ground up exclusively for the Xbox 360. It looks like Halo 2 and Shadowrun are going to have to hold down the Games for Windows Live service all by themselves. Earlier this month, Capcom announced that a playable version of Street Fighter 4 would appear at the AOU 2008 Amusement Expo in Japan. In the meantime, Capcom has been nice enough to share a new batch of screenshots showing off the game's detailed 3D backgrounds and electricity-filled particle effects system. These latest screens also show fan favorite Ken Masters taking a fireball point blank in the face from his red and white garb rival, Ryu. The game is believed to be a multi-platform title, but to date has only been confirmed as an arcade release. With Grand Theft Auto 4's quickly approaching release date of April 29th, Rockstar Games is preparing themselves for public outcry regarding the game's crime-centric premise. After a recent 90-minute press demo, Rockstar Games VP Dan Hauser said that he expects reactions from the mainstream media simply because they've had so much of it in the past. He also wished that video games were treated the same as other types of media. That's all for today's gaming update. Be sure to visit us on the web at g4tv.com slash xplay to continue getting all of today's up-to-the-minute video game news. But now let's go over to Adam, who is ready to give us a preview of a game that has three of our favorite things. Big guns, dinosaurs, and elite special forces. Thank you, Morgan. Well, there's nothing worse than tracking down an escaped war criminal on a dangerous foreign planet. Well, unless you throw some hungry raptors into the mix. Now, this is the task set before Joseph Turok and the Dinosaur Hunter's latest installment. Here's our preview of Turok. It's 6 a.m. The early morning sunlight filters through the jungle canopy and glints off the blade of your Kabur USMC combat knife. It's zero hour, and soon you'll kill, 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 kill. Sorry, I just had a flashback to my time in the sh I've got to remember, Charlie's not the enemy here. That big-ass Utah Raptor is. And he's just one of the prehistoric enemies you'll encounter in the to-be-released Turok. So we're here with Josh Holmes. He is the head of Propaganda Games, who is making the latest Turok game. I guess one of the questions I've always had is, why Turok? So, I mean, what we wanted to do was kind of take the series back to its roots, get back to the things that made Turok so cool when it first came out, um, and then, you know, kind of reinvent it for next gen. This is a planet that's kind of got its its own crazy evolution cycle. So you will see some cool creatures. Um, and then, you know, the thing that we've really focused on is putting the creatures and, and the human opponents together in, in, in kind of a sandbox and letting you do your thing and use them against one another and play them off of each other. So you mentioned the game sort of uses sandbox play. What is the structure of the game? Is it not your typical linear shooter? So the story of the game is, is fairly linear, you know, in the way that we kind of parse that out. But what we've tried to do is create these areas in the game that are sandbox zones, sort of combat zones that you can approach in a number of different ways, which is awesome. Um, basically everything in, in the game is completely dynamic AI. So, you know, every time you play, the AI is making decisions based on what you 
you do and what each of the AIs do. So it all plays out differently each time. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about the single player game, but multiplayer, uh, how is it going to work in, in, inside of this new Turok universe? It's uh, a variety of different modes. So we've got competitive stuff like deathmatch, team deathmatch, capture the flag, it's all capture the flag, objective modes, we call it war games, but it's basically uh, objective based team play. And then we also have four player co op. So we have a few specific maps that have been designed as co op missions. That you probably don't get to play as a dinosaur. No playing as a dinosaur. Okay. Well, you heard it here first. Sandbox gameplay, sticky bomb guns, dinosaur suicide bombers. What more could you possibly want? Oh, a release date, huh? Turok is scheduled for release on February 5th, but we'll have the review tomorrow. Coming up on X Play, we dive into the endless ocean with our brutally honest review of this undersea odyssey. And then we go on location to a game store made for gamers by gamers. Plus, one of the original scary games makes its next gen debut. We preview Alone in the Dark. It's just ahead. Stay tuned. <laughs> X-Play presents GDC 08. Come along as Adam and Morgan uncover the very latest in gaming. X-Play from the GDC starts February 18th, only on G4. Welcome back to X-Play. Sometimes the call of the sea can be like a siren, beckoning underwater explorers to a briny depth. But she's a harsh mistress, and potential adventurers like me are often hindered by the fact that it's cold, it's wet, and there are sharks. Thankfully, there's a new game that allows me to travel a few leagues under the sea without ever leaving my couch. Here's our review of Endless Ocean. Endless Ocean is the sea diving simulator for the Wii that's, well, barely a video game. There are almost no clear-cut goals here. Most of the pleasure is simply derived from exploring the ocean in all her mysterious beauty. You play as an expert scuba diver, but there isn't much of a storyline, save for a frumpy love interest that you occasionally chat with on the boat. The draw here is the beautiful underwater environments. The seas of fictional island Manoa Lai are teeming with virtual life. You'll frequently get to feed fish, pet dolphins, and thank stingrays for killing Steve Irwin. Allegedly. We're just hoping we don't get into trouble with the FCC for tickling blue tang on the air. As you explore the briny depths, you'll unlock brand new areas on your sea charts. You may have noticed Endless Ocean features some funky music that sounds a lot like Enya. We know it's weird, but it sort of works for the laid back atmosphere. Since this is the Wii, you can control your character simply by pointing at the part of the screen you want them to go to. And since this game doesn't require precise movement, it works perfectly. There are some assorted mini games, like the ability to train your dolphin buddies and collecting different species of fish for your aquarium. But for the most part, the game is good because it's so relaxing. Admittedly, this is not for everyone. But if you're not embarrassed to play casual games, you have got to check this out. Endless Ocean gets four blue tanks out of five. Endless Ocean is definitely a relaxing, soothing game, almost trance-like. The atmosphere will allow your mind to wander, but sometimes I guess your thoughts probably go places they shouldn't. Through the dark. Could you please turn off the Enya? Sorry. You think the new Batman movie is going to turn out okay? Oh my god, how could you say that? What? It's a legitimate question. It's insensitive and selfish. Jeez. Oh, come on. You didn't think the same thing when you heard about it. Okay, maybe. Maybe for half a second. But I have a conscience. I have feelings too, but I'm also worried that after finally pulling ourselves out of the Schumacher ghetto, the whole franchise could go down the tubes. Listen to yourself. You care more about a fictional character. I care about the whole canon. You worry about that more than a real person. Can I care about both? Look at where we are. We're at the bottom of the f ocean. And this is what you want to talk about? Yeah. I hope you get eaten by a shark. Now that's insensitive. Do you know how much air we have in these tanks? Not much. And you're wasting it talking about the fate of the next Batman movie. Did you see what happened with Nancy and the Sopranos? Instead of killing her off, they tried to continue with that horrible CG. It almost derailed the entire series. Look, I'm gonna go over to this reef. I think I see a clownfish. Just leave me alone. 
Well, all I know is we didn't go across town to the IMAX to see I Am Legend because we're big Will Smith fans. With your Great. That's mature. Coming up on X-Play, we go on location to the next-gen game store of your dreams. And later, we're going to give you goosebumps as we preview Alone in the Dark. Stick around. Is there a chance that Left 4 Dead might also appear on the PS3? Welcome back to X-Play. Thanks for your question, Ichi the Sniper. Um, well, you know what? Turns yeah. out the EGM is saying that it will be going to the PS3. We don't know this empirically ourselves, but it, right. it, that is what people are saying. So it seems like it's going to be likely. We're also, of course, going to see the Xbox 360. Yeah, if it's going to be in one place, likely. it'll be in the other. So Yes. Anyhow, well, I'm sure most of you probably get all of your games at the local corporate whorehouse. You should know that this isn't your only option. Far from it. We went on location to check out a next-gen gaming store and discovered a veritable magical chocolate factory of fun. In the bustling Garnett Avenue shopping district of San Diego, an independent store called Games On is attempting to push gaming retail in a brand new consumer-centric direction. The source of this madness? Owner Andrew Urbanic. The philosophy behind Games On is to create a store that's sort of responding to what the industry is doing now, that is maturing with the industry. Games On will look pretty alien as someone used to a typical game store. It's open, airy, and clearly much thought has gone into the interior design. This is a video game boutique, a true video game boutique. The service should be a step above what you would find at a big box store and much more personal. And these people who are purchasing games drop three-figure receipts every time they walk into a game store. We've had a lot of people surprised that we can do a store like this and not increase our prices. There's simply no reason that a customer should pay for my choice of flooring. All games in the store are shown on HDTVs exclusively. These days, games are run in high definition. Games are created in high definition. So walking into a store and seeing it on a small 20-inch monitor isn't going to do the game justice. The approach seems to be garnering positive response all around. Definitely has more stock than any other game store I've been to. There's even a super high-quality demo room for showing off the top titles to potential buyers. Games On represents what is hopefully a new trend in gaming retail an attempt to mature an element of the industry that hasn't matured in decades. We provide a place where they can. They can browse on their own. They can ask questions and feel like they're being listened to. They can ask questions in an environment that they feel more comfortable in. And by doing so, they can learn more about what video games offer. Last week, Mr. Sark asked you to join him in a chase through World of Warcraft. A resident hardcore gamer stepped in the role of a fugitive on the run to see if you could track him down. Now, he quickly found a whole server full of people after him, and here's what went down. Earlier this week, on the sleepy little server of Nazjatar, Stormwind Castle had a little problem. His name was Doc Thimble. Thimble thought he could evade the authorities, but he didn't count on, well, so many authorities. Even hours early, there were so many recruits preparing for the search that the server began to lag. Doc had to turn to some Nazjatarian Samaritans to help him get into the castle unseen. And when Doc Thimble finally emerged, the search was over before it started. The lucky winner, who happened to be peering under the staircase where Doc appeared, was Terran Rip of Norganon. But that was just the beginning. First order of business was a massive foot race through the castle, which was won by the fleet-footed Harrison Ford, aka Jadids of Illidan. The search may have been brief, but the anarchy continued for almost two hours, finally ending with a massive dust-up with a Horde raid. Which reminds me, we would like to congratulate the Horde Guild nascent on a very successful raid. Perhaps Doc Thimble will have to pay them a visit sometime. When X-Play returns, we preview Alone in the Dark, which is the fifth game in the creepy franchise. And thankfully, 
has nothing to do with Uwe Boll. But first, let's take a look at who's keeping the beat in today's leaderboard. Here are the people with the best scores in rock band's solo drums mode. Welcome back to Rex Play. Back in 1992, Rex in Effect was teaching us all how to shake our rumps. And PC owners retreated to one of the scariest video games of all time, Alone in the Dark. Now, 16 years later, the game is back from the grave in its fifth installment. Dropping the numerals, the new chapter is simply named Alone in the Dark. Catchy, here's our preview. Edward Canby seems to be having a very disturbing day. He doesn't know where he is, and he doesn't know how he got there. Canby's century surfing story continues in Atari's redux of Alone in the Dark. We sat down with Atari's Todd Slepian to talk about the game. The new Alone in the Dark is basically one cataclysmic night in New York City. What we did to make Central Park appear as it does in, in real life is Eden, the studio that's creating this, um, they used uh, satellite imaging technology and, and GPS technology. They use thousands of photographs as well and photo rendering to come up with an incredibly realistic um, depiction of New York and Central Park. The fire in this game is pretty revolutionary. If you take an object and stick it in the fire, it's going to start to burn and then it's, it's going to progressively build across that object. You can break an object and stick it in the fire and use it as a torch to light your way in a darkened area or you can use it against your enemy as a weapon. The inventory system is done in real time um, and it doesn't take you out of the action and in a separate inventory screen. Basically with the press of a button, uh, the main character opens up his jacket and that's where all his inventory is. It's done in real time so if an enemy was attacking you, you'd be attacked if you were looking inside your jacket to find an item. Everything that you do see in the world you'll be able to pick up, you'll be able to interact with. You can pick up things and use them as a weapon. You can pick up things and break them. Uh, the ropes in the game display real world properties. You can tie them around yourself. You can use them to scale a building. It's all about immersion, keeping the player in the game. The original Die Hard was a huge influence on the developers. It's basically one man struggle against seemingly overwhelming odds, um, and that's basically uh, what what takes place in this game. It's it's the it's the struggle of Edward Carnby to figure out what's going on around him in one given night against seemingly impossible odds. As most of you are probably aware, Alone in the Dark was turned into a movie by the famous Uwe Boll, or infamous I should say. Of course, critics panned the film, audiences ignored it, and a friend of mine gouged her eyes out during the first reel. The film certainly did not help the long-standing tradition of horrible video game to movie adaptations, but believe it or not, it's not all Dr. Boll's fault. In today's X list, we take a look at the top five bad video game movies not done by Uwe Boll. At number five is Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. This movie looked great at the time, and well, that's about it. At number four is Street Fighter, the movie, which managed the feat of having a storyline worse than the actual game. Look, it was so bad, it killed Raul Julia. Coming in at number three is Super Mario Brothers, the movie. While the casting of Dennis Hopper, Bob Hoskins, and John Leguizamo might sound interesting, this movie set back adaptations for at least a decade. And our number two is DOA Dead or Alive. Just a word of advice, if you ever receive an invitation to fight in a kill or be killed tournament on a remote island or an invitation to see this movie, you pick the tournament of death. It'll be less painful. That's good advice. And our number one, the all-time worst video game movie ever is... Doom. It's aliens meets red planet meets I'm gonna put a gun in my mouth to end the pain. All right, now in case we just woke you, it's time for X Play Replay. <laughs> Dr. 
Today we reviewed the Wii's diving sim, Endless Ocean. While it may sound like a snooze, the game actually manages to deliver a hypnotic, enjoyable experience even with the Enya sound alike. This relaxing journey into the sea will probably save you some money on day spas. We gave Endless Ocean four starfishes out of five. Now that's all we got for you today, but be sure to tune in tomorrow night at 8pm for an all new X-Play. On Friday's show we'll have our review of Turok. We'll see if raptors, big guns, and stabby combat make for a good old time. Then we find out what it takes to bring the noise in video games as we profile a sound designer in Will Work For Games. Plus, don't make any rash football bets before you see our Super Bowl predictions. And hold off on making that chip dip, too. It's really good when it's fresh. It is much better when it's fresh. Yeah, Otherwise, you know, we're going to have a lot of sick gamers the guacamole around guacamole gets here. that brown stuff on top, and you're like, ah, so just make it fresh. That's disgusting. See you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Play the center of the gaming universe. Today on X Play, we review Turok and see if this reimagining of the dinosaur hunting franchise will make it out alive. In Will Work for Games, we show you what it's like to step into the shoes of a sound designer. And we'll preview Supreme Commander for the Xbox 360 and see how well this real time strategy game makes the transition to consoles. Hold the line, it's game time. Welcome to X-Play TV's most watched video game show. I'm Adam Sessler. And I'm Morgan Webb. We're coming to you from the G4 Studios in Los Angeles on Friday, February 1st. Oh, it's already February. <laughs> on today's show, we learn the joys of busting caps and dinosaurs in our review of Turok and see if this reboot is a success. Then we'll show you what it's like to step into the job of a sound designer in We'll Work For Games. Making things explode is harder than it looks. Plus, the DS gets apocalyptic. We review Advance Wars Days of Ruin, which could be in the running for the award of biggest handheld downer. And we'll preview Supreme Commander for the Xbox 360 and see if this PC gem will satisfy console lovers. But first, let's go over to Adam, who has all of the day's top stories in our gaming update. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. Well, for years, the skateboarding genre of video games was dominated by Activision's Tony Hawk franchise. But EA has just revealed that Skate is outselling Tony Hawk's Proving Ground by a ratio of nearly 2 to 1. And these are pretty impressive numbers when you consider the fact that Skate launched on three fewer platforms than Activision's Proving Ground. I hate to say it, Mr. Hawk, but it might be time to put down the skateboard and get back to the one you draw things on. But it wasn't all good news coming out of Electronic Arts yesterday. Among EA's announcements during their earnings call report, a widened release window was given to both Pandemic's Mercenaries 2 World in Flames and Digital Illusions first-person shooter Battlefield Bad Company. Both games are expected to be released within EA's fiscal year 2009, giving developers a shipping window between April 1, 2008 and March 31, 2009. That hopefully is enough room. Last year, Will Wright's multi-platform evolutionary sim game Spore was expected to be released somewhere between March and May of 2008. While an official release date still hasn't been announced, EA feels they are confident the game will be released sometime before the holidays. Those of you who started holding your breath back at E3 2005 might finally be able to exhale later this year. Finally, we've got good news for fans of Portal and Team Fortress 2. Valve's Doug Lombardi recently confirmed that a Portal sequel is currently in the works. While details are very scarce, the game is expected to feature a deeper storyline and even more mind-bending puzzles. New Team Fortress 2 maps are currently being prepared for the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360, but no release date for the maps was announced. But once finished, the downloadable packs will be available free of charge. Well, that's all for today's gaming update. Be sure to visit us on the web at g4tv.com slash xplay to continue getting all of today's up-to-the-minute video game news. But now, let's go over to Morgan, who has our latest review. Thanks, Adam. Now, I am not normally one to sanction hurting animals, but there comes a time when it's just plain necessary. You know, like when a raptor's chewing on your leg, or you ever see Barney on the street? I guess we should face it. All dinosaurs have it coming. And here's our review of Turok. Look around, 
you may not believe this is the long-awaited return of the Turok franchise. In this brave new universe, Turok, once a mystical Native American warrior, is um, a space marine. This Turok, right? I know all about you. Do the video game writers also go on strike? Anyway, you're out to kill your one-time mentor and now arch-nemesis when your ship crash lands on a planet infested with dinosaurs. Oh, that was a dinosaur! There are actually quite a few good ideas on display here and some quality AI. If you play your cards right, you can watch as the overgrown lizards feast upon your enemy. These distinct behavioral routines between human, dinosaur, and other creatures keep the encounters from feeling rote and familiar. But when it's time for you to shoot, the game's major failing comes into focus. The shooting mechanic is deeply problematic. You see, Truck simply doesn't have any of the aim assist the most modern shooters have, which help you get a reticle on the bad guys. This makes the game unnecessarily frustrating and overly challenging for less experienced shooter players. And certain weapons feature some serious kickback, which complicates matters even further. Because of these issues, you'll wind up using your knife more often than you'd like, and find yourself taking less creative courses of action throughout the game. Turok gives you a couple of multiplayer options, like your standard deathmatch and co-op mode, but the finicky, imprecise aiming ruins those experiences as well. We really enjoyed the game's atmosphere and AI, but sadly, the targeting in Turok is a big enough problem that it simply makes the game hard to recommend. I don't like the sound of that. We're sorry to say that Turok is a three. Two. Out of five. Coming up on X-Play, in our preview of Supreme Commander for the Xbox 360, we'll see if it's worth trading in your keyboard for a controller. In Will Work for Games, we show you what it's like to work as a sound designer, and we'll talk to you in our virtual audience. Stay tuned. Gamers know. X-Play is always at the center of the most important video game expos. Now we're taking you to the first big gaming event of the year. X-Play presents GDC 08. Come along as Adam and Morgan uncover the very latest in gaming. This is now one of the must-have games. And profile what's to come. It's five days of exclusive interviews, trailers, and demos. X-Play from the GDC starts February 18th, only on G4. Welcome back to X-Play. The sound design can make or break an immersive video game experience, but who are these audio wizards that create lush phonic landscapes, and how can you get into this sweetening profession? Well, take a listen to this, we'll work for games. By now, you should know that working in the video game industry isn't all game testing and TV show hosting. Today, we're going behind the scenes with a sound designer at Chaos Studios, where they're working on Frontline's Fuel of War. Sound design is uh, was a huge undertaking as a beast because of some major features that we wanted to do. Probably the biggest thing about uh, the entire sound design undertaking that had to be done with this game is certainly the uh, LOD system. We wanted to make sure that the sounds traversed through distance as well as really impacting you in, in a close environment. All right, but what does a sound designer actually do? One of the ways that I work is I, I'll, I'll load up a white room, and a white room is like the matrix. It's a place where I can get the, the sounds that I made and apply them to the actual weapons and the technology in there. And it's, a, it's a really good place to test all the sounds that I'm using. But it's not all matrix rooms. So one of the challenges was definitely recording all this battle chatter that we had to do for single player. The goal of the battle chatter was definitely to inform the player uh, as to the enemy's locations and what kind of enemies are out there. And if you're hoping to get your foot in the door, sound design is definitely one way to go. The best way you can get into a studio is, is definitely from a sound design perspective. There's a lot of need for grunt work. If you can get in, then you can work your way up. But once again, this is a job that actually involves working. Because it's really a lot of work. 
I mean, we're here a lot of hours and we're late. I'm sleeping here in the studio sometimes. But for Matt, the work pays off. Yeah, I can't wait for the players to experience the immersion of the natural aspects when a jet is flying away from you and it transforms and you just hear it sound natural, you know? Or when a helicopter flies away. Sounds good to us. I always thought it was a guy in a room with a mic going, Anyway, in case you haven't heard, there's a little football game going on this weekend in Arizona, and not the one with the puppies. Seasoned warriors will come from New York and the greater New England area to engage in combat at an unforgiving 100-yard field of battle. Who will emerge the victor? Thanks to modern technology and Madden, we know. Super Bowl weekend. The most important weekend in the history of America. The entire free world and those living in caves, that means you, Osama, will all be watching Super Bowl 42. Who will win? The dynamic New England Patriots, owners of the greatest illegal videotape collection since Bob Crane was alive? Or the surprising New York Giants, who made it to the big game after stepping all over Jesus Christ, I mean Brett Favre, to get here? Boston or New York? Always an interesting matchup if you live in Boston or New York. To no surprise to anybody that watches football, sorry World of Warcraft fans, the Patriots will be in full control of the game. They just won't be denied. Tom Brady will march his Patriots down the field like a man who impregnated a B-level actress and left her for a supermodel. And Giants quarterback Eli Manning? Well, you've had a decent playoff run, but this is the game where you finally realize you're Eli Manning. The Patriots' defense will be too tough. However, don't despair, Giant fans. Michael Strahan will get two sacks on pretty boy Tom Brady. Not bad for an 85-year-old man. Tom Brady, while not as dominating as we've seen, will control the second half as well with steady passing and nice dagger catches by Randy Moss. The incomparable Randy Moss goes in for the touchdown. The Giants, they're just in the way. So while it won't be a rout, it'll still be a Patriot win. 2010 New England Patriots. Congratulations, Tom Brady. You're still leading the most perfect life ever. I guess cheaters do win, and winners do cheat. When X-Play comes back, we'll unleash our review of Advance Wars Days of Ruin, as well as talk to you and our virtual audience. But first, let's take a look at today's leaderboard. Here are the warriors that are currently dominating Madden 08. Welcome back to X-Play. The turn-based warfare powder keg known as Advanced Wars returns to the DS. And this time, it has a darker theme and online capabilities. Aw, oh, baby's all grown up! Check out this review of Advanced Wars, Ace of Ruin. Fighting a war in a post-apocalyptic world isn't as scary as it sounds in Advanced Wars Days of Ruin. Sure, turn-based tactics games aren't for everyone, but this DS game is pretty accessible, even for the casual gamer. You were just a carefree cadet in Military Academy before meteors wiped out most of civilization, but miraculously, you and your hair survived the blast unscathed. The story lacks the charm of previous games, but it's easy to look past the gloom and enjoy the first-rate strategy. There are also a number of new features that make Days of Ruin a pleasure. There's a whole feast of new military units, terrains, and abilities, and you can also design your own scenarios and play them online. Hardcore Advance Wars fans may feel betrayed by some of the changes, but if you can forgive the new, gloomier style, it's definitely worth a play. Advance Wars Days of Ruin avoids four meteors out of five. For years now, you've been watching us, but now it's time to turn the tables. Kind of. We want to hear from you, so we're letting some of you at home into the G4 studios virtually. So join us as we welcome our virtual audience. Joining us tonight is Chris from Dallas. Chris, what's on your mind? 
How you doing, Morgan? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm great. In great. your opinion, does review scores really matter? We like to think they matter yeah. since we spend all that time exactly. making the reviews. You know, sitting going, I don't know, is it a three, is it a four, maybe it's a two. We don't want to lead people astray, so it, it, the burden actually weighs sort of heavily on us in a yeah. way. Now, now, Chris, do they matter to you? Do you use some reviews to help make your game purchase decisions? Nah, it really depends on the game because it really depends on what type of games that you're into as far as strategy, fighting, sports, you know. It really just matters what kind of gamer you truly are. So if we give maybe a strategy game a 5 out of 5, that's not going to make you buy it at all? Right. I mean, I may not be in the strategy, but you may be into it. So by you giving it a 5 out of 5 for those strategy gamers out there, it's really a good pick. All right. That makes sense. That's Thank fine. you for the question, Chris. Next, we've got Charlie coming at us from New York. What can we do for you, Charlie? Hi, I was uh, just wondering how you feel about the current model for music downloads in Rock Band and Guitar Hero. I actually think it's, it's it's quite effective. Obviously, the the amount of money that they've made on just the downloads for Rock Band, which I think is what two point one million dollars. Well, I just think it's great. I mean, you, there just can't be enough songs on the disc exactly. to make it great. And you can always think, oh, I can always get some new songs. I mean, what kind of songs do you want to download, or you're hoping that you're going to see more of? Hoping for more like speed metal songs because I'm really looking for a challenge when I play. And see, I would be sad if Rock Band came with nothing but speed metal. So I would, yeah, I would like actually the folk pack. So I can actually get really high scores on it because, because it's just, just slow and exactly, mellow. Exactly, slow, two notes, you know, little boxes <laughs> or something. Um, yeah, that, that, that way I would feel good about myself. So there's something for everybody now. All right, up next, we have Ammo from Texas. He wants to talk to Nintendo. Go ahead, Ammo. Hey, I just wanted to know if you two are excited for Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Well, I think we should ask maybe first, are you excited? Oh, yeah, definitely. I just wish it was about delaying it, you know? really soon now. Yeah, yeah, actually, we will be actually showing it next week. So we will uh, be. We, we've already gotten our excitement slightly satisfied. Uh, but it really, I, I, I am excited, though there's so much excitement about this game. I don't know why this one particular game seems to generate that same kind of, like, you know, frothy mouth. It's nostalgia. It's nostalgia. Everybody loved it as a kid. Everyone had a great time with it. And you think Nintendo's making it? They're going to be a solid game that you're going to play a lot. Your friends are going to come over and have a great time. I think it's going to be good. And I think there's so much in this game that pretty much will yeah. last you to, I don't know, July, August, something like that. Yep. And finally, we have Dave from California. What is your question, Dave? Hey, guys, how's it going? Doing all right. Right, and I was just uh, wondering if you guys had a chance to download Res HD yet. Yep. I think that everybody needs to do this. I mean, for a while, the only way to get Res was to go on eBay and right. bid on it and pay 70-some dollars and, you know, God help you if you wanted a trans vibrator, you know, because that was going to be another exactly. tons of money. So I think that it's a deal for everybody. Go out, spend the Microsoft points. I'm, I'm assuming that you've downloaded it. <laughs> Have you? Well, I think Chris has. I think there's no question about that. I think there's that. no question Chris has. All right. Well, thank you for that question, guys. That's all the time we have for our virtual audience. But do not fret. We're going to do this again very soon. And who knows? You might get the chance to join us in studio. Virtually, of course. All right. Stay right there. We'll be back with more. Just a minute. Up next on X-Play, we climb into some badass mechs for an early look at Supreme Commander for the Xbox 360. You don't want to miss it. Welcome back to X Play. In 2007, PC users were introduced to Supreme Commander. We named it Strat Year, and now the RTS is set to invade consoles very soon. Here's our preview of Supreme Commander for the Xbox 360. At last, the universal fury of the Infinite War is getting closer. We sat down with Chris Mayer, creative director of Hellbent Games, to see how much of Supreme Commander's depth carries over to the Xbox 360. It's a complete intact port of the PC version. We had to drop only six maps. That's the only thing difference between us and the PC version. We have uh, the Xbox Live Play with four players. We also added two new game modes for online play that are only on the 360. One of Hellbent's main goals was to bring the size and scope of the game's unit max to the console. We actually didn't lower the unit caps down. We have the same unit caps as the PC that comes out of the box. You, of course on the PC it's scalable. As the PCs get better you can turn the unit caps way up. We can't do that, but we support the same number, 500 units per team, up to 2,000 units when you're having a four-player match. So we actually have 
all those units still in there. A challenge was translating the PC control scheme to the console controller. No one wanted to make a PC game interface on the console. Nobody wanted to make you feel like you're playing some port. They really wanted to make it feel like it's special. And our big breakthrough would be a control wheel. We use a wheel selector that allows you to gesture. You bring the wheel up and gesture to pick your units you want to build and to select commands you want to do. And it really keeps everything immediate and at your hands. Hellbet wanted to maintain the strategic immediacy of Supreme Commander's zoom feature. Strategic zoom, I mean, that's, that's the key feature that sets Supreme Commander apart from every other RTS. Basically, you position with the left uh, analog stick and with the right analog stick, push in where you want to see and push out. It, it works very much like the PC version. With processing power rivaling that of a PC's, the RTS may have begun to find a new platform. I think we've introduced the game and now we're advancing the game. We're purposefully taking it a step forward even further. We're just excited to see more RTS because it just means there's more people who are going to be out there looking for games like ours to play. Look for Supreme Commander for the 360 sometime in early spring. It's Friday and we're ready to empty our heads of a week's worth of information, so we should probably do an X-Play replay. This week we reviewed Endless Ocean. This diving sim took us to the lushly rendered depths of the sea and relaxed us to the equivalent point of a Thai massage. It fished up four stars. And then there was Turok. With gun control looser than an NRA rally, the Dinosaur Hunter only managed to scare up a three star score. And earlier in the show we saw Advance Wars Days of Ruin. This pocket apocalypse boasts new units and online gameplay, which promotes it to a four star general. Now that is it for today, but be sure to join us next week for all new X Play every day at 8 p.m. Be sure to tune in this Monday because we are going to go hands-on with Super Smash Brothers Brawl. And not some Japanese import like you've seen on the net. This is the real deal, the American version. In fact, we won't stop there and we're going to bring you exclusive Smash Brothers footage every single day next week. You won't see it anywhere else. Also on Monday, we go hands-on with Sega's Condemned 2 Bloodshot. Get ready for some drunkenness and devastating finishing moves. And later in the week, we review the Nero Star Vehicle Devil May Cry 4 and find out whether or not this Devil Bringer is worth picking up. Tune in or miss out. All right, well, thanks for watching this week. And we'll see you next week. Exactly. <laughs>